you had a three interception game against the Panthers. I don't like to hang my hat on that game because I like to hang my hat on the whole body of work, right? Not just one game. I, I don't know, just the different aura that was around the Tampa Bay Buccaneers when Tom Brady signed. The vibe was, we're gonna win. I think there was an incident, right, with Bruce Arians. I, I mean, I just want you to clear the air. And now, yeah, hit me in the helmet. <laughs> you know, we met at a barbecue, and it's, this is a nice place that you got, by the way, so I appreciate you letting me be here and set up and, and do this thing. And I, I think I approached you wanting to film a workout, which I still want to do, by the way. For sure. So we're not we're not done with that. Yeah. But as you're getting ready, trying to get back into the, the swing of things, trying to make a 53-man roster, you know, if someone gets injured, which, I mean, by the way, week one went, you know, there's already some injuries, so you never know, uh, trying to lock up that spot. But uh, what's free agency like for you? Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely waiting around. Um, but at the point of my career now, I'm kind of in that transition phase. So free agency, um, is definitely waiting, but you have to be proactive in other aspects of your life. So that's kind of, um, where I am now in free agency. Um, but you do have to stay in shape, right? Cause when that call does come, you're going to be asked to do a job and you have to be physically able to do that job. So, um, staying in shape is important. And uh, you talk about those other aspects that you're trying to pursue. What what exactly are those things? Probably around year year four, year five in the NFL, I started investing in real estate, uh, specifically residential real estate. Um, so now I'm, I'm as I'm transitioning out of the NFL, I am uh, selling my residential portfolio um, and liquidating and to get into you know some other you know some other avenues um, you know of passive income, so to speak. Um, and the second avenue would be starting a company with my father. Um, well, I wouldn't say starting, I would say partnering and expanding on his existing physical therapy clinic. Um, so it's, it used to be called Southern Crescent Physical Therapy, now pro-level recovery. And um, we're gonna be dealing a lot with, you know, personal injury clients, um, auto accidents and sports injury, obviously, of, of course, because we have that, you know, that professional athlete background. Um, and we, we've seen a lot of sports injuries, you know, as far as me and my dad, um, you know, my dad has treated me through extensive injuries throughout my career, you know, other, other NFL athletes, professional athletes. So um, a lot of injuries we see on the football field, you see in car, car accidents and auto accidents, you know, some people would describe, you know, football collisions as many car crashes. So a lot of the injuries are the same. And so that's where we look to provide that, you know, elite pro level expertise to the general public um, that they won't, wouldn't normally get um, going to your average PT clinic. Yeah, and definitely having that name, like you said, of a professional athlete background definitely adds to that. Uh, and actually went over and, and helped you film some of that as well. And it actually, you know, it looks promising. It looks awesome. You know, you know, your dad seems like he knows what he's doing. So, you know, excited for that venture as well. Um, but, but yeah, passive income is, is huge because actually Alex Arma, which I don't, I don't know if the camera on this can see the jersey in the back, this Panthers jersey, but he wants to invest in real estate as well. But more so on the side of maybe renting out or buying homes and then renting them out. Okay. Um, passive income. I think that's that's really smart for professional athletes, especially given like, you know, there's that stigma of people just blow through their money, just like that. For sure. Have you been like really smart with yours and trying to put put it away? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I haven't been a, a huge spender, so I came into the league as an undrafted guy, so um, I never had, I, I would say, excess money to spend right, to, to blow, right? So all the chips I got, I would try to maximize and, or save. Um, so that was really, that was really my journey in the league, you know, was really trying to stack as many chips as I can. Um, so, you know, going into year nine, I, I've, I've stacked some chips, but it's, it's not life-changing money. So you have to figure out what to do with those chips in order to create that generational life-changing money, right? So of course. that's kind of how I got into real estate, um, you know, was the first avenue, which which has been lucrative and good, but um, I don't want to get out of real estate. I would just like to get into more commercial real estate, uh, specifically triple net leases, 
Um, so I'm a part of a Bones Investment Group, um, and the owner of that is Teal Teal Henderson and Noah. Um, so they're they're huge in helping me navigate in the triple net commercial space, which is a triple net lease is um, a tenant, a commercial tenant such as Chick Fil A, Starbucks, Target, Publix, that um, basically rents your property and they cover. They cover the taxes, they cover the insurance, and they cover all the, you know, maintenance and, you know, fees that comes with the building. So basically that's really extremely passive. Oh yeah. It's a lot of stress off of people's shoulders as well. Right, right, right. So that's uh to me is a little uh more passive than residential real estate versus, you know, I buy a house and you're my tenant. Um, you know, you might also not treat the property like it's supposed to be treated. You know, uh, you might have dogs. You might, you know, be a smoker. You know, all these other things, right? Um, that, you know, I would be responsible and liable for, have to come fix. Um, you know, Starbucks is going to take care of the building, and they're responsible for paying. If the roof, wow. ca- if the roof caves in, they have to pay for it. So, I don't see anything <laughs> wrong with that. I mean, that's yeah, you don't have the responsibility of that. That's that's pretty awesome. Uh, but you're talking about going into year nine, uh, and, and in, you know, the endeavors, we still want to pursue that, but mainly it is the NFL. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that undrafted journey. So you were raised here in Atlanta, went to Woodward Academy, right? and then you were starting to get offers. What made you settle on Connecticut? Were you thinking about other schools as well? Well, yeah. So if, uh, I was really a kind of, I wouldn't say I was a baseball guy, but I spent the majority of my um, like skill training on baseball, you know, like one-on-one coaching, travel baseball. So I was really trying to play baseball in college, and I committed to Furman my junior year uh, to play baseball. Um, even though, you know, I still love football, I was still playing football. Um, so my senior year, I switched from corner to safety, and uh, I played really well, and then I started getting some football looks. Um, so it was like Georgia State, and it was like their first or second year in the program. Um, Tennessee, Chattanooga, Eastern Kentucky, so some of the you know smaller but D1 schools. Um, and then UConn came, and they were going to a BCS bowl game. Um, they were playing Oklahoma that year. So, you know, that was really eye-opening. I went up there for a visit. They were preparing for the bowl game. Um, so, you know, it was a lot of excitement around that time. You know, that kind of really, and I did like the campus. Uh, it was obviously cold, but, um, you know, it was new facilities, you know, big time, you know, D1 program, you know, playing, you know, big time schools. Um, so I was like, you know, I didn't really want to miss out on that opportunity. And fo- football was my first love, so didn't really want to give that up. It definitely worked out for you at, at, at UConn. You know, you were pretty solid, but, uh, trying to get into the NFL, I think just the fact that if you have that bigger name school attached to your resume, that increases your chance of getting drafted. But even if you do well at a smaller school, you can still go undrafted, which right. was probably your case. So wh- what's that like for someone that, I, I mean, I don't know in, in particular, did you know that you were going to be like a late round slash undrafted? Did you, was it like a lot of nervousness when you were watching the draft or? Um, I mean, so I would say, I mean, as far as big school, little school, I remember the year before, I think it was, um, I saw Landon Collins get drafted and he was drafted to the Giants. I actually played with him. Um, and then I saw, you know, they flashed his stats. It was like 90 something tackles, like two or three interceptions. Um, so going into my senior year, like that was my goal. I need you know, 90 plus tackles, two or three interceptions. And I, you know, I might not be, you know, a first, second round draft pick, but that should put me on the map, you know, basically. So that was kind of my goal. I got, had like 88 to 90 tackles. I looked at maybe three or four interceptions, um, you know, and kind of early throughout the year or maybe mid year, you know, NFL agents start to reach out to you. Um, you can't sign with any of them, but they start to reach out. So I, that kind of made me, you know, see that, okay, there is an opportunity, you know, keep playing well, keep doing what you're doing. And then, you know, we'll see how it goes after this. And so after the season, um, you know, you talk to agents and, 
they kind of tell you, you know, kind of their prediction, you know, um, you're going to be a first round draft pick or we think you could be a late round draft pick. You know, you got to go through pro day and all these things. Um, so I didn't, they thought I was going to, I was going to get invited to the combine. I wasn't invited to the combine. Um, and so then you just had pro day. So I did well in my pro day. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say like blew it out the water. I'm not like a freak of a nature athlete. I mean, I'm a good athlete, but nothing, you know, that's gonna like, oh, wow. Right. So, but, um, you know, did well, you know, you know, all the drills. Um, so agents, you know, getting feedback from teams, you know, thinking, okay, you might go in the fifth, sixth round, seventh round. Um, am I okay? You know, so just kind of waiting around for, you know, a late round call right before the draft starts teams start to reach out to you and just make sure they have the right phone number to call, uh, make sure they have the right um, representation to call. So I got, you know, probably five or six calls from a few teams just making sure they had the right draft day phone number. So I'm thinking maybe it might could be a late round, you know, situation. Um, so on day three, that's when you kind of wait, not really hearing much and, you know, going back and forth with the agent, blah, 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 blah. So you don't hear your name called. And then probably like five to 10 minutes after the draft ended is when the phone started ringing. So I got a call from the Jets and the Giants. The Jets, um, it was like a scout maybe that reached out um, and invited me to their mini camp. Um, and the Giants, the position coach, my safeties coach reached out and they offered me an undrafted free agent uh, contract. So obviously I went with the Giants over the Jets. Um, and yeah, that's, that was the start of, that was the start yeah. of my career. And you talk about how it's usually after the draft, everybody starts calling everyone because you see the draft go by and it's like, okay, day three, five minutes on the clock, pick after pick after pick. And then once the draft ends, all of a sudden you see all these tweets coming out like, here are like seven and 10 players at the Giants. Yeah, right, right, right. So everybody is, seems like once the draft is over, everybody's calling, um, even like towards the late Yeah, round. so there's probably, I don't know, maybe like seven undrafted free agents. So you probably, what, if a team has a pick in every round, seven draft picks, and then they'll probably sign, you know, around seven or so undrafted free agents. So yeah, yeah that's when everybody, I mean, maybe a little more. Maybe less, but yeah, somewhere around there. No, I mean, it's definitely the journey of perseverance, being an undrafted free agent, and then having to work your way up. Because of the Giants, you were starting to build your name, get your name out there, and, and play after play, trying to make a you know an impact in the league. Uh, I think it was like, I, I don't know, tell me if I'm wrong. Maybe there was like a play that you can remember before this, but probably the biggest play that kind of put you on the map early on was like probably an interception that you had with Carson Wentz. Right, right, right. Was that like the turning point for you, would you say? I would say, I would say I definitely helped. Obviously turnovers in the league are, are big. Um, I mean, most, most coaches and front office, you know, personnel want players that can change the game. And on defense, you change the game by creating turnovers and getting the ball from the offense. Um, so that was big. Um, and then I would say just playing solid throughout my rookie uh, year. Uh, so obviously I wasn't expected to play. They drafted a safety and they had other safeties. So due to injury, I was able to play early on and being able to show what I can do, having the opportunity, you know, um, you know, the preparation met opportunity. So that's kind of what happened there. And like I said, I, I played, I played, solid throughout my rookie year. So they felt comfortable with me, you know, in that role. Um, even though that was, that was, that was my only interception that year, but I did make other plays on the ball. So, and like you said, I was, I was, um, where I was supposed to be when I, when I'm supposed to be. Yeah. And then, uh, 2016 ends, 2017 starts and, you know, you're with the giants, but then, uh, what was it only a two year contract? Did they release you? What happened? Undrafted free agents, if you're drafted, your contract's four years, undrafted three years, but obviously you can be cut at any moment because um, you don't have any guaranteed money. So, you know, it's not like a team is losing money if they release you, right? Um, so my going into my third year, 
uh, the coaching staff got fired, the front office got fired. So they brought in a new staff, new new GM. Um, so going to that training camp, obviously I've played well the past two years, but you know they bring in you know some guys that they like, and then they retain some of the guys on the existing roster. And then you go through training camp, and then they pick out their fifty three. Um, so I, I wasn't one of those 53. Um, so I was released from the Giants and I think Tampa picked me up, uh, week, week two or week three, um, uh, of 2018. Uh, you had a three interception game against the Panthers. Yeah, I did. I did. That was in 2018. Yeah. So that was the first year I got with the Bucks. I, I remember seeing that. Yeah. Cause I was doing research for this interview and watching highlights and, I think Cam Newton threw four interceptions total in that game, he three did. of them to you. Yep, and uh, one to a nickel, J.B. and Elliott. Yeah, our man, that, what would you say that was like probably the the best game that you've had in your career? Um, in, in professional career, probably for sure. I mean, how do you beat a three interception game except maybe getting four? <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but no, I haven't had four. I had a three interception game in college, so that was a good game as well. Um, but yeah, no, that was definitely – um, one of my best games, obviously, in the NFL. Um, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't like to hang my hat on that game because I like to hang my hat on the whole body of work, right? Not just one game. Um, so, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's against a former MVP and Cam Newton, so that is something that you should be proud of as well. Uh, and then 2019 comes, and then uh, I think the 2019 Bucks season is very well remembered for. Uh, it's I call it the thirty for thirty. It's the Jameis Winston. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, <laughs> yeah. That was that year. That was uh, what. What was it like? I know you're you're not on offense, but watching all that, being around Jameis Winston with he's so good, five thousand yards, thirty three touchdowns, and then I mean, first of all, Jameis is a great teammate, right? Obviously, you see the things now that you know is all over social media, but I mean, Jameis has always just been a genuine guy and. Uh, you know, a uh, positive locker room presence. So, you know, it's nobody's um, belittling him in those moments or, you know, looking down on him. Um, obviously, it's all, it's all you know, signs of encouragement and, you know, things from a teammate that you'd want to hear. Um, so, I mean, yeah, those moments can be hard to overcome. And, yeah, they do put the team at a whole in a predicament. But, um, I mean, every nobody's perfect, right? So you kind of, you know, you just kind of roll with the punches, right? You know, kind of make best out of the situation that there is. I mean, because he makes great plays, and then it's like, oh, that, that was a bad decision. So I really think it's more just decision-making versus, you know, like a player issue, right? No. I mean, props to him. Having the confidence, like, hey, I trust my guys. I'm going to throw it up to Mike or whoever. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, and – if it's intercepted, I mean, yeah, that sucks. But you know, at least I, you know, made a shot that I believed in. And yeah, yeah. But as a defensive player, I mean, yeah, it's just you got to go back on the field, right? Exactly. We, we might get a turnover, and then they turn the ball over, and then we're back on the field. The stamina, I'm, I'm guessing, had to be right, pretty yeah. top notch. I mean, um, sudden change is what we call it, right? You know, you're just on the bench, you know, going over the last series, you know, getting some water, and then it's how we got to go back out there. So. But when you go back out there, you have to be, you know, at your best. So it's, that's not an excuse to let the other team score or, you know, we weren't ready. So, I mean, um, I think a lot of that, a lot of that prepares um, football players that are accustomed to sudden change like that. I think it prepares them for life um, because there's a lot of things that happen in life that, are unexpected, you know, deaths, sicknesses, and families, you know, relationship issues. And um, a lot of people, you know, kind of go into a ball in those situations. And the people that can, you know, persevere and move forward, I think, um, are better off for it. So I think that prepared, you know, just those sudden change moments in life, you know, correlate directly to football. No, that's a great way of looking at it. I love that. Um, and you said Jameis Winston, very good teammate, and you know a lot of people speak very highly of him. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out because after that season, he moves on. 
but then there's a new person <laughs> in town and the sudden shift and, and mentality and I, I don't know, just a different aura that was around the Tampa Bay Buccaneers when Tom Brady signed. Uh, can, can you describe what the locker room was like, the organization, and uh, I guess comparing it to pre-Tom Brady when he played for the Bucks and post-Tom Brady was... I mean, the 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 vibe was we're going to win. Like, I mean, he signed the best quarterback, you know, arguably best ever in the game of football, best player really in our league. Um, it's like, we're going to, I mean, cause we were a good team with Jameis, right? Um, but obviously you add a, the best quarterback in the league to an existing good team. And you know, that confidence just is, is there, which is really the main thing, right? You step on the field, you know, believing and knowing that you're going to win the game versus stepping on the field. like. Let's see what's going to happen, right? Um, and when all 53 guys in the locker room are like that, then it, you're you're hard to beat. Like I said, everybody was thinking, oh, we're going to win. We have the best quarterback. Everybody was agreeing to all these veteran minimum deals like Leonard Fournette. Rob Gronkowski came out of retirement. <laughs> Antonio Brown as well. Hey, B, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so it was, <laughs> that, yeah, that was a, yeah, that was a fun year. <laughs> I, I know that he came from New England, though, and – the Belichick Brady era is probably known, at least you hear from a lot of players, like, oh, it's not fun over there. Um, and you just said it's the most fun year. So the locker room wasn't like as strict or? <laughs> um, so after that, after my first year in Tampa, you know, the year I had the interceptions, um, I was trying to emerge myself as a starter in the league again. So I signed with Detroit and free agency and didn't go back to Tampa in hopes of winning a starting job. And I didn't win that starting job. Um, so that's when I went back to Tampa, which was the year we just talked about with Jameis. Yeah, so I went to Detroit, right? And we had Matt Patricia, head coach. Um, and he had just came from New England. So he was implementing everything New England in Detroit. Um, so all the running hills after practice, conditioning, jumping off sides, team takes a lap, all that type of stuff um, was implemented in Detroit, which was, you know, similar to New England. There was a few coaches that, you know, kind of in the New England tree, um, you know, got c coaching jobs elsewhere, and it kind of was like that in the building. Um, but no, Tampa wasn't like that. Um, I mean – I guess Tom kind of fit into, I mean, the culture we had already built in the locker room. Obviously, you know, he's a big presence, but, you know, he just kind of brought that, you know, that extra layer of confidence, I would say. Man, it's, I mean, it's so cool to see Bill Belichick nowadays, and, you know, he's in the media, he's like all, all loose and kind of himself. But yeah, and, you know, you think about New England, and I mean, they won for sure, uh, but, you know, they definitely seem like they, they were on like a, regime like you know keeping strict and i mean yeah, yeah. just know that brady comes in and just kind of let loose and uh just kind of vibes with the culture that was already established was pretty awesome no doubt but that buccaneers tenure uh bruce arians being the head coach uh i think there was an incident right with bruce arians i, I mean i just want you to clear the air there was a pile bruce arians was kind of getting <laughs> people away from them and you were in the middle of that pile or at least on the outside and he kind of pushes you, and then that nah, was, ended up being a whole deal. So what, nah, what exactly me, happened? And nah, yeah, hit me in the helmet. <laughs> I didn't know until that day that that was like a. I mean, you you can't hit people. But. So I guess more backstory to that is so the year after we won the Super Bowl in free agency, I signed with Philly, try to become a starter. Um, I think Roddy McLeod was hurt, so they were kind of looking for a starter politics played out I ended up back in Tampa um so and then we were playing Philly in the playoffs so I knew everybody on the roster there was a fumble I, I forgot who had the ball but the play was you know pretty much over and I was kind of messing with one of the other safeties on on Philly's roster because we knew each other obviously I play safety play safety um so 
Bruce Arians, I guess, saw that as something that might could be flagged. Um, but yeah, so he came out on the field, hit me in the helmet. Yeah. And he got fined for it. Was there a conversation on the sideline immediately between you guys, or was it like in the locker room, or did you guys never talk about it ever again? I don't think it was ever talked about ever again. Uh, I'm, I might have approached them. I don't really remember because it was a uh, – I mean, I felt like as a head coach he would address it and you wouldn't leave it up to the player to, you know, come address it. So I was in the position of I need to go talk to him about it, you know, clear the air basically. Um, I, I don't really think that ever got – So I mean – Yeah, I mean, there, there wasn't a lot of – I might have went to go speak to him, but, I mean, it is what it is. No, I mean – I feel like if anything, I should have got the 50K. <laughs> Yeah, for the damages, man. Yeah. You know, the trauma that he cost you. Because, um, I, I mean, I, I was trying to look up, did he actually win the appeal? Because he tried to appeal it. Because I think the media addressed him and was like, hey, are you going to... I don't think he won the appeal. Uh, he didn't win it? Yeah, well, 50K short. That, that's what he gets, <laughs> man. I mean, um, but, you know, whatever drama that was, whatever politics, whatever, you know, it's just all bridge un- or water under the bridge and you guys end up having another great year. Um, and then, oh, I actually didn't mention, but the year that you guys won the Super Bowl, I see that game ball over there, Yep, yep. that game against the Green Bay Packers. You're trying to go to the Super Bowl. Uh, it was freezing. But, yeah. I, I mean, I can imagine. And then Aaron Rodgers, you know, is having this MVP season. Uh, but then you guys come into town, Scotty Miller catches a touchdown. Uh, describe your role on that and why you got the game ball. Uh, well, I think the defense got the game ball but my role going into the game was you know all four special teams I think I had uh you know a few packages on defense but our starter Jordan Whitehead um I think he tore his labrum like the first play of the second half so I had to basically come in and play the whole second half and I played well I made a few plays and like one of the last plays I think it was the call they were um, – they went for it, and I think, you know, people said they should have kicked it or – but yeah, it was like yeah. third and goal or something like that or fourth and goal, and he tried to throw Devontae Adams like in the middle, and me and the other safety converged and knocked it away. Nice. So it was a de- good play. But, um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think that, I'm pretty sure that was – I mean, I don't exactly remember, but I'm pretty sure that all the defense got the game ball. Yeah. No, definitely. That's that was a memorable game for sure. Uh, but then your your tenure in, in Tampa ends, and then you move on, and you know you have some stints with the Titans, the Ravens as well, which was last season. Uh, and like we talked about at the beginning of this interview, you're just in free agency, still training, still staying in shape, so that whenever that call comes, you'll be ready. Um, has there been any interest? Would you say in free agency so far? Yeah, uh, it's been slow, but there's been a couple of teams reach out just seeing if I was in shape. Uh, you know, obviously ready to go. And, you know, we tell them, yeah. And that's about it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, yeah, I mean, you can't tell them no. Yeah. Exactly. But, yeah, I mean, that's that's really kind of how it goes. They, I mean, those teams, you're probably on what they call the ready list. So, yeah, obviously, if, you know, they need anything at that position or something at another position and they have a roster spot, then, you know, they might call you. Um so yeah, it's kind of now it's just all opportunity. Has that ever come into fruition where someone has called you, say, "Hey, are you ready to go if we need you?" And you say, "Yeah," and then they actually do call you. The only other time in my career I've been in this position was last year, and I was I was coming off of an injury with the Titans, um, so I tore my patella um, in like the second to last game of the season. So going into year eight. I was a free agent coming off of an injury. So obviously teams have a little more concern, you know, saying like, are you ready to go? Um, you know, are you hundred percent healthy, et cetera, et cetera. So last year was really the, um, you know, first year of me really, really experiencing that for the most part. Um, and last year, the Baltimore, they weren't a team that 
they called me that day and was like, we want to bring you in for a workout. It wasn't like a call a month before, or a week before, like saying, hey, are you ready? We might, we might bring you in. It was, you know, immediate almost, so. And then with roster cuts already happening, the NFL season starting, the 53-man roster is already locked. So what what's that like for a free agent? It's really just, hey, if someone gets injured, then I'm getting a call, right? It's not like, oh, Andrew Adams, we like him. We want to just see what... I guess it depends who you are. Um, I mean, there, there's a point where, you know, they might not like the young guys that are on the, that made the 53 man roster. So they might go sign a veteran, um, you know, after they see that these young guys um, need a little bit more development. So they might go call a veteran um, that they know can do the job. Um, and then, yeah, you have the situation where you're just waiting on an injury. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's probably other situations too as well, but those are probably the main two. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, well, hopefully something happens. And, uh, you know, I filmed a little bit of your workout and, uh, you know, definitely want to film you more with pads on. But uh, just seeing you work out, you could tell that you're in pretty good shape and you're Maybe. ready. <laughs> You know, and, and I mean, it seems like you've got a good head on your shoulders as well, you know, with all this investments that you want to make, passive income and, um, you know, selling down as well, having a family and, you know, de definitely, you know, a, a good life that you're living for sure. And uh, hopefully you can continue your NFL career. So appreciate it. Yeah. And thank you for taking the time to do this. No interview. doubt. No, it was awesome, man. I, no, I appreciate you.